There we go. Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Perfect. Austin, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a little bit of an intro. For those of you that don't know Austin, he's also an Aggie. He dual majored here in finance and economics. He worked for Coke, which we're going to hear from a little later on today out in Wichita, Kansas, and then ended up, uh, I think you may have like bumped around a little bit in between here and there, but you ended up at the Andersons and you've been there for, I believe, four, four and a half years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, we're really appreciative of you being here. Guys, we've been able to have a great partnership with the Andersons and Coke and a few other great companies out in Wichita. Just move to Wichita. It's a great place if you haven't ever, ever been. But I'm just going to go ahead and let Austin get started. Austin, thanks again. Thanks, guys. So today I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction to commodity trading. Um, and boy, there's never enough time, right? So I'm going to go through just some basic examples. Um, see if I can get my screen up here. Basic examples to try to give you just some fundamental principles to help you understand what I do. Um, and really what finance, how finance applies to commodity trading as a whole. So everybody see my screen? Looks great. All right, thank you. All right, so like I was mentioned, I work for the Andersons. I live in Kansas City, go Chiefs. And we trade commodities. We are heavy in the agricultural commodities. I have a couple stats here for you. Um, in addition to the energy sector, the ethanol and frac sand and some other byproducts of that. Um, something interesting about us is we trade a lot of commodities that are um, on screen or who are related to a futures market. We also trade several commodities who have absolutely no uh, futures market or strictly flat price, strictly cash. Um, and we have a prop desk and several other factors. We have a rail group, a fertilizer group, um, very diverse in that regard, but I'd really like to focus just on the fundamentals of what commodity trading looks like and um, how a trade kind of functions. So starting out here, uh, I think everybody here may have had an introduction to what futures are at some point. Basically a future is a derivative or a financial instrument that's made to represent a value um, of some underlying commodity. And these contracts that you can buy and sell all have specified criteria that are set. Specified volume, quantity, timing, location, um, and so forth. So for example, I've got up here on the screen a quote that I look at. This is from a couple days ago I'm from Chicago Wheat Futures. So this is what Chicago wheat is worth. And if you look here, you see my mouse, I hope. Uh, you've got your symbol, which represents December. CWZ is a symbol of the derivative. December timing, it's Chicago wheat, and here's your price that the last contract traded at, your daily change, open, close, and so forth. So each one of these lines represents a different contract, and then down below you have different spreads between different contracts. So these financial um, futures are traded in several different commodities, you know, including corn, soybeans, lumber, oil, gasoline, heating oil, metals. So when I was at Coke, I got introduced to a lot of the energy side of the business. Um, and ultimately, really, once I got familiar with how trades flowed, I, I really wanted to be the one making decisions, which is what led my transition to the Andersons. Um, but the main point with these futures that I'm looking, the one I, I hope to communicate, is that as a trader, you're looking for ways to either put on risk or take off risk, depending on what you're looking for. And these futures give you a very liquid market to go out and hedge against. So cash basis is related to futures price. It is your cash price minus your futures price. So if wheat is worth $5 cash, and let's say it's worth that in, I don't know, someplace in Iowa, $5 cash and futures at 550, at the time, your basis is 50 under or minus 50 the December futures. So when you buy commodities, you go out and you sell futures to hedge that flat price, which leaves only exposure to a basis. And I hope I'm not getting too technical here. I'm trying to keep it simple, I promise. Um, so for example, if you were to go buy cash wheat, you're gonna go sell Chicago wheat futures. Or if you're gonna go sell cash wheat, you're gonna go and buy futures against that. So why does basis vary and why do we want to trade it? Well, basis varies by local supply and demand, transportation costs, different quality, different grades of different commodities, and different timing. You'll notice on the last screen, these futures months, there was a December, March, May, July, September. 
Well, there's a lot of months in between there and the timing on features about on commodity values differ quite a bit other than just five slots a year and different commodities have multiple months and so forth. But what a commodity trader really tries to do is they try to trade the basis because they feel like it's more predictable. And also there's just more controllable variables that they feel like they have a specialized niche in relative to the futures market. Now, it doesn't mean you don't trade futures at all as a spec. We definitely do that, but we try to build all of our trading models here around a cash perspective. And we feel like that's what gives us an advantage. Um, moving on, I'll give you an example of how this can really be a powerful tool. So let's say we as the Andersons, we want to pay the producer a high price. And we want to sell cheaper than we bought and still make money in between. If you think about that fundamentally, it sounds kind of weird, right? How could you sell something cheaper than you bought it for and make money? Well, let's go through this example. Um, let's say we purchased this commodity back in June for $4 from the producer. And let's say futures of corn at that time are worth $3.95. And this is a pretty viable example, actually, that could have happened this year. Um, it's pretty realistic numbers. So we would have we would have bought the cash price, right? We would have ventured into that with a, a commercial elevator or with a producer. We would have gone and sold futures at 395, resulting in a basis of five over of the December futures, because this is for October, or let's see, let's call it November delivery. So comes October and the futures are down. We're down to 356. And we turn around and sell this corn to an end user at the same location uh, for November shipment. Once again, same timing for 390. And we go back and we buy our futures back at 356. So walk through the PL here for me with me for an example. Your cash price, you're gonna lose 10 cents a bushel, right? We bought four dollars, you're selling 390, but your futures gain. You sold 395, you shorted at 395, and you're buying back at 356, you're gonna make 39 cents, resulting on a 29 cent PL gain on the trade. So, real simple, and I know I'm going fast here, but it really shows you the power of understanding when different buyers and sellers wanna come into the marketplace, how to capitalize that, and how to leverage financial markets to help you make a profit. Moving on here to another thing that we use all the time here is cash arbitrage. Now arbitrage is used in several different ways um, and all of them have somewhat of a similar meaning, but one aspect of being a commodity trader is the transportation of commodity from point A to point B. So this is a pretty good example that I was just looking at the other day. Uh, back in June, we sell exporters wheat to Portland, Oregon. Oh, and by the way, I manage all of our Idaho assets. Um, and so, I'm gonna use some of those examples here because I'm a little more familiar with them. So let's say we sell exporters delivered wheat in Portland, Oregon for 80 over the December futures, right, for December shipment. And let's say freight from Portland to Idaho is 98 cents a bushel on this wheat. And in November, let's say Mexico milling demand increases, but let's assume that wheat in Idaho is completely sold out. You have no more cash wheat to offer without going short, and going short probably doesn't seem like a good good idea in a market that's rallying its face off. So let's assume our freight to Mexico is $1.40 a bushel. So what my job is, is to go out and find replacement values relative um, to where I have things marked for it. And the premise around this is mark to market accounting. Um, hopefully you have an opportunity to be introduced to that at Utah State at some point. So the idea is you go buy wheat out of Washington and you buy that into Portland at 85 over, and then you go sell Mexico at 152 over, um, netting yourself a 20 cent margin. Once again, kind of showing some P&L flows down here. On your initial trade to Portland, you're gonna lose five cents a bushel. And here's your FOB equivalent numbers. But on your trade to Mexico, you're gonna clip an extra 25 cents. Now, these are really simple examples, but this is something that happens all the time, um, especially when you consider some of the varied users that happen there that, that need products in our space. Uh, for example, there's some pig feeders that can switch between corn and wheat. And so you'll sell, you might sell wheat <clears throat> to these feeders and then replace it with corn as those values shift. And really having a knowledge about transportation costs and the psychology to, um, behind what's driving these price movements gives you opportunity to capitalize. So what's it take to be a successful trader? I think it takes an economic mindset. You need to be able to think about, okay, what drives prices in one direction or what, what's the psychology of my market participants 
that's going to impact my price movement. Understanding market-to-market -market accounting principles will really help you capitalize on arbitrage opportunities and help you move on from losers quickly and help you move and keep your winners when it matters. You need to have an appetite for risk. Are you comfortable losing money? Are you able to come in and make a decision um, if either decision is going to be a, a big loser? You need to have an entrepreneurial spirit, the ability to go out there and brainstorm and find new ways to capitalize on what the market's presenting to you. And then honestly, in my opinion, the ability to be self-taught is probably the biggest part of it. When you come in, especially to a business like ours, where we have several different profit centers, each one functions as a small business, it's hard to have a lot of the support for somebody to be there and teach you everything along the way. You really got to be comfortable going out and finding a way to teach yourself and asking the right questions to learn quickly. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn time over to you guys for some questions real quick. And here's a fellow coworker of mine. I'd love to have you contact him. Any questions from anyone? I know that was pretty quick. I'll kick it off. First off, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, just a quick question. You spoke a lot about the ins and outs of what it looks like in a day to day and how the models work. And it's all very fascinating. What are some things that you'd recommend for someone who's considering to go work in that field? What are some things they should do? How would they go about it? What are some things that might be of benefit? I think the number one thing is networking. Um, commodity trading is a very, very niche industry, especially with all the consolidation that's happened these days. So the biggest thing is finding someone who is able to get you an interview. Um, and then skill-wise, what's going to help you from there is having a strong understanding of what futures markets are and how those financial derivatives work. Um, and then really building those people skills to be able to call someone and build a relationship over the phone. In the cash market, that's probably a skill that's decreasing more than I'd like to admit. Really appreciate it. Other questions for Austin? Hey, Austin, it's Mike. How's it going? Good, thanks. So I just had a question about your initial exposure to commodity trading, and then how did you know that that was a career that you would want to pursue? Boy, that's a great question. I would tell you my initial exposure kind of came just by opportunity, right? Coke came to campus, and they have a big commodity trading firm and really kind of exposed it to me that way. Um, I grew up in southeastern Idaho and grew up on an agricultural farm. And so I had connection to those ag markets. So once I learned the finance behind it, just connecting those two markets where I had some knowledge base, just it was a perfect fit for me. I was able to stay tied into some of those markets where I naturally had interest um, while still participating in some of the finance markets that I also enjoyed. Um, if you want to know if it's for you or not, take a thousand dollars and just try to go trade some futures markets on it and see how it feels. Sounds good to me. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, you bet. Good question. What is the recruiting process like to get into that industry? You know, we're going to hire some interns. Um, each firm's a little different. I'll tell you, we're going to hire anywhere from three to five interns this year. You're going to come in, you're going to be given an opportunity to kind of prove yourself. If you do so successfully, you'll be given an opportunity to come in and do two six-month rotations. Um, so really the important thing is getting in front of a recruiter and then just killing the interview. Um, people skills are really important to us here. And so being able to just find a way to connect with that recruiter, I, I know it's a generic answer, but that's really it. Just finding somehow to get somebody's, somebody to look at your resume seriously. Yeah, you can go and get different work experiences that'll be helpful too um, on the ground level. But a lot of the guys that work here are previous engineers or previous um, salesmen even, and have learned the finance later. So there's really no golden bullet. Didn't mean to cut you off there, Austin. I apologize. We got time no for one more question. Okay. Austin, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We've got his contact information in the chat. Feel free to reach out. Thanks again. Thank you.